Hey guys, this is Georgia with Ancient Aliens, and you're listening to that one time I was abducted by aliens with Jamie and Bree. You're listening to that one time I was abducted by aliens. I'm Jamie. I'm Bree, and we're two sides of the coin. Happy holiday season, truth seekers. Welcome to another episode. Tonight, we're going to be going into our third episode of the Secret Space Program. Yes, but before we get into that, I wanted to recap really quick just to get some things straight and clear it up. There's a lot of information and detail about this subject. It's impossible to remember it all. And it isn't until after I listen to our recordings that I notice all the stuff that we leave out. Mm -hmm. So real quick. There were simultaneous German agendas that were parallel to each other. There was the traditional Nazi party that we all know of, but separate of that, it's what's known as the German breakaway civilization in Antarctica. That was actually set up by the German occultists, such as the Order of the Black Sun, the Thule Society, and the Vril Society that had the ET contact. The occult societies, the Germans that were in Antarctica, formed the alliance with the Draco reptilians and became their own secret space program, enabling them to engineer advanced spacecraft during World War II. They were able to establish bases on the moon and on Mars with the Draco, which is known as the Dark Fleet, but we can get into that in our later series. The Brill Society basically vanished. And we talked in our previous episodes on the different versions of how that could have gone. But it is said that Maria, the channeler for the Real Society, was also a Nordic herself. But it was also rumored that she was just pretending to be a Nordic. That she would be landing in these flying saucers and spreading false stories to other contactees. And to me, I think that makes sense. If you think about all the different versions of her, I think that would be a connection between all of them, if that were true. We don't know, but to me, that would make sense. Something extremely important that we also missed, there was a document that was recovered by the CIA called the Red House Report, dated 1944. Um, When it became evident that the Nazis were going to lose the war, the Nazis had to prepare to secure a post-war foundation by pulling out their funds and covertly financing themselves. They stated that until a Fourth Reich could be established, they would move underground. The Red House Report specifies where the industrialists and bankers could directly disperse major Nazi capital and resources. It was done through shell companies in neutral countries like Switzerland, Argentina, and Sweden, just to name a few. I'd say even Cuba in there because a lot of people say that Hitler's down in Cuba. Mm -hmm. It was like Spain, Brazil, Mm -hmm. probably Cuba. Yeah. There were, there were a lot of them. Which it seems to be a lot of those places, too, are the places that people say Hitler, you know, lived the rest of his years at. So that's, you know, kind of all makes sense, because if that's where all the money was, obviously he was going to follow it. Anyways, this involved major corporations that they worked with before the war, such as IG Farben and Volkswagen, who had worked with major U.S. corporations like Standard Oil. So funds were easily sent to U.S. subsidiaries that were actually German-controlled. I think it's crazy to think about that's sort of the beginning in my mind of how German funds could be dispersed into U.S. corporations and the Mm -hmm. fact that they were German controlled, it's already sending their resources into the U.S. Well, I think what it is, is it's really the precursor for Operation Paperclip. As we all know, the Germans are incredibly smart. Like, that's how they got ahead, and that's why we, quote unquote, stole all of their scientists and things. Obviously, they knew that the war was coming to an end, and it was something that they couldn't publicly win. And I think that they definitely took measures to make sure that they were set up after everything was done so that they can continue their work. Yeah, I find that document to be extremely important. And I do suggest that anyone that's listening to go look it up. This is something that you can read. There's so much detail into it. And it really specifies as well how it really was the occult elite who were the masterminds behind this whole German breakaway civilization. You can kind of see how it wasn't really just that the Nazi party was completely squashed by the Axis powers, but that they were smart. They planned for this. So at this point, they've pretty much created a German powerhouse. They have the military power from the Antarctic Germans, 
plus the major capital from the German industrialists and bankers. Well, and then you switch that over into they're now utilizing the United States as basically their factories. Once you incorporate Operation Paperclip, and once that was sort of into way, they had constant contact with each other. It was said that they were able to infiltrate our secret space program, or what was to be our secret space program. They tried with all of their efforts to slow it down. So keep in your mind that there is the Germans that are involved in our space program, but at the same time, you still have an independent German program. Just to clarify that big difference. So while there's a whole lot going on with the Germans and the war, here in America, we also had some strange people that were making moves, and it wouldn't be right to skip over the most important players and their roles in our conventional steps towards the space program. One common thread throughout this entire series, apart from the ET component, is occultism. So tonight, we're going to talk about the one and the only Jack Parsons. The grandfather of NASA, the inventor of American rockets. I mean, really, who started NASA, or what is NASA today? Jack Parsons lived a interesting yet short life, I will say. Um, he was born in 1914. And did you know that his real name is actually Marvel? Mm -hmm. He was named after his father, but after his father and mother got a divorce, um, he went by Jack. But it's actually interesting if you think about like the Marvel comics and all the weird in a sense, entities mm -hmm. and all the their superpowers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So Jack Parsons, like all human beings, had a mother and father. But when Jack was about one years old, Jack's mom kicked out her husband for sleeping with prostitutes. He was getting his little nasty, nasty <laughs> freak on, to put it bluntly, and she kicked him out of the house. And after that happened, his dad moved back to Massachusetts, where they originated from, and her and Jack's mom's parents moved down to California. They had a lot of money, they were a very wealthy family, and they ended up buying a house in Pasadena, California, which during the time was called the Millionaire Mile. So although Jack Parsons grew up you know, in a wealthy family in a really nice neighborhood. He wasn't a kid who was very social. He spent a lot of his times indoors, reading, hanging out with his housekeepers and things like that. He just wasn't very social and he didn't go out. He did, though, end up making one friend in elementary school named Ed Foreman, who really became his best friend in life and protected him and shielded him from all the bullies and the kids who were mean to him and really took him under his wing. And the two of them became quite the pair and were very inseparable. Both of them were really, really inspired by science fiction and literature. And the two of them together started off at a very young age making amateur rockets or the beginnings of amateur rockets. Jack also wasn't a very good student, although he was incredibly smart. He wasn't very good at taking tests or grades. It's said that most geniuses can't actually stay in your typical school. They need something different, something else that grabs their attention. Which is definitely what happened to Jack, I think. So he went to school, wasn't very good at it, got kicked out for having really bad grades, and then his mom ended up sending him to a private school where he then immediately got kicked out of for blowing up the toilets with cherry bombs. <laughs> Which my dad did when he was a kid, too. I think all kids kind of do that kind of stuff. But I think to Jack, it meant a little bit more because he definitely was thinking out into the stars. He was like, this is my calling. <laughs> So he came back home, he ended up graduating high school and then going off to a junior college and ended up leaving junior college because one, his grades weren't that wonderful and he needed to get a job. The Great Depression was coming, you know, it was right the beginning of the end of the war where everyone was going to work, all these, you know, resources in the United States, people needed to go out there and work if they weren't a soldier. He actually ended up in the long run going to Stanford and doing incredibly well there. He was the epitome of a perfect scholar, but had to drop out because once the Great Depression hit, his incredibly wealthy family lost all of their money. In 1934, he reunited with Ed and, you know, they got the band back together per se. And they ended up meeting with a guy named Frank Molina and they formed the Caltech affiliated Guggenheim Laboratory, short galactic. <laughs> I thought it was him and his group of friends that were known as the Suicide Squad. When they would get together and they would do all these experiments, they would always be blowing shit up. So word around campus, they would call them the Suicide Squad. Oh, I like that. And I think that's where another Marvel link comes Ooh, into play. Interesting. So this Galactic Rocket Research Group got together 
and they did a bunch of fucking experiments and they did cool shit. <laughs> But the problem with it was is that they didn't have a bunch of money and they couldn't really do the things that they wanted to do. But in 1939, the Galactic Group gained funding from the National Academy of Sciences, NAS for short, to work on Jet Assisted Takeoff, J-A-T-O, for the U.S.'s military, which, surprise guys, this is the beginnings of rockets and rocket fuel and those kind of things. And it should be said that while they were doing this and they were playing around with it, no one took them seriously. It's very well documented that other people that they reached out to, other professors, they made fun of them. They didn't see this as something that could actually be feasible. It was something that was kind of a joke. Like, you can't take a rocket to the moon. He was really pushing boundaries at that point. Absolutely. In 1942, they founded the Aerojet to develop and sell their J-A-T-O technology. And the Galactic Group at that point got turned into the JPL which is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 1943. Now, before we get too far into the JPL, we need to kind of take a back step in the timeline because I think really to understand how the JPL was created and how all of these experiments and stuff really happened, I think we have to go back and talk about the things Jack Parson did in order to create rockets and talk about Parson's other very, very good friend and um, I want to say the world's favorite antagonist. So we're going to go back just a few years before the JPL was created, back to when the Galactic Group first gained their funding. In 1939, Jack Parsons, who, like I said before, had been dipping his toes here and there into occultism, converted fully over to Thelma, which was Aleister Crowley's new religious movement. Jack was known to have already been doing these weird type of ceremonial magic, which is really what Aleister Crowley did. It was all about the ceremonial magic. But his other colleagues that were in the Suicide Squad knew that before he would even launch these rockets, he was out there doing these strange chants. He was already trying to conjure this magic. He was trying to combine science with magic. He was trying to mesh these together. Aleister Crowley really, really enjoyed that. He was big on the occult. He was big into science. But I think what Aleister Crowley brought to the mix that Jack was missing in all of these rituals was sex. <laughs> we aren't going to do a deep dive into Aleister Crowley tonight because that's an 18-part episode that we could do because I'm obsessed with him in every way, shape, or form. Weird. I know. And I don't think we'll ever do an actual episode on him because in retrospect, he doesn't have anything to do with aliens. But a cult, absolutely. He's like the cult god. When I think of occultism, I see his weird face. I would say I think of him as the grandfather of American occultism, personally, yes, I what agree. I think of. In a sense that he was the most famous version of it. I'm not saying that there weren't people before him who were into occult, because I'm sure the, the FFCs will jump down my throat if I say that. Did you know it was said that they accidentally opened a portal? Yes. There was a portal and a being came through, an interdimensional being that they said the name was Lamb. Mm -hmm. If you read about the descriptions that they read, it looks like your typical gray alien. Yeah, for sure. And they believed that it was an interdimensional being that they were able to make contact with and that they could open up portals and have conversations with these interdimensionals. To that effect, they also did later in life attempt to try to open a portal from hell that didn't work very well, that took them several years to do, which included Aleister Crowley building an entire mansion for himself. But like I said, we're not going to get too much into Aleister Crowley and the crazy shit that he did. But that links Jack, the beginning of our space program, mm -hmm. with occultism mm -hmm. and also links to aliens. So are you saying that there's a possibility that we're going to do an Aleister Crowley episode? No. <laughs> You got my hopes up. And plus, because I don't like how you say Crowley. Crowley? <laughs> Crowley? You're like, as to Crow one, one moment, you want Alistair. Alistair Crowley. Crowley. So if you guys know anything about Alistair, his big thing that he's known for is sex magic. I think that sex magic will go down in history as the one thing that he was into. <laughs> 
So you have Jack with this huge knowledge of science. You have Alistair with this huge knowledge of the occult. And you put the two of them together. And as you can imagine, some weird shit happened, which is where Jack Parsons really starts being not necessarily discredited for his work, but definitely his personal life was swept under the rug as much as it could be. Absolutely. He has this giant mansion in Pasadena where everyone's coming over. They're all taking drugs. They're partying. They're doing this sex magic. The police were coming every night. And then by day, he'd be back in the lab pretty much. And so obviously word gets around with that. You have kind of a split person at this point. I mean, just imagine Bill Nye the science guy. If like if Bill his Nye, daytime, yeah, wasn't like if, <laughs> if, if Bill Nye like on the DL was like into Satan and like orgies, like that's basically what this is. Yeah, but then you knew you could drive past his house every night and they would be partying, mm-hmm. like super tough with like pregnant naked women running around all over the place. Yeah, there's like this one weird story about something about he was gonna get somebody pregnant because it was gonna be Satan's child, and then it once was Babylon. On. It was yeah. They were pretty much trying to impregnate people to have this demonic Babylon, Babylonian magic creature, whatever it is, be into the baby, and then they could give birth. So I mean, I know that part of their ceremonies, they would be like jacking off all over the place. Mm-hmm. They were trying really hard. It's almost like the talks of when Satan is born that it's just going to either come through some woman and just planted the way that the story is of Jesus, Mm -hmm. but in a demonic version, and they were trying to create this themselves. And what I will compare their rituals to a little bit, and this might seem a little bit weird, but do you ever watch that movie, The Secret? But The Secret is about the law of attraction. Yes. Okay. Yes. So how the hell could okay, you? Okay. Let me link it. Let me link it. Let me link it. When you think about the secret, one of the things the secret tells you to do is to put your intent out there, right? Yes. So you put your intent out there and whatever intent you're putting is what you're going to be getting back. Yeah. So Alistair and Jack also believed in this intent and they had a very serious belief in it. But what they thought could one up this intent is have the intent while you're orgasming. Ooh, I like that. So a lot of these times what they would do is at these big mansion crazy parties that they would have is they'd be fucking. And then right when they would orgasm, they'd be yelling out the things and the intent that they would want. So if you can imagine, let me set the scene. Oh, my God. It's 1943. Jack Parsons is naked. Balls deep inside that pussy. Ew, stop. (laughs) You can't put that in there. Jack Parsons. Banging one out. And as he orgasms, he yells, I want to be in space. Oh, okay. Interesting. I still don't see how that links to the secret. You could say the law of attraction in general. Well, but I'm putting it in a sense of what people think of. Like when you think of, when I think of that intent, like putting your intent out there, I immediately think of that movie, The Secret, like personally. Mm. Think about that, but just more a nasty version of it. They genuinely thought there was some sort of cosmic power and some sort of maybe portal or void being opened when you were orgasming. So what they would do is at these orgies, try to get everybody to orgasm at once and say and think about this intent and this thing that they wanted to do. Now, we don't really have knowledge about the things they were saying or what kind of intent they were putting out there. (laughs) I would hope it's good and wonderful things, but you never know. I think it was just for that baby to be born. I mean, possibly. So while all of this is going on, the JPL is being made. Like, it's the beginnings of it. This is when the Galactic Group becomes JPL. And everyone over at JPL who's working there is very, very aware of Jack Parsons and his occult side and the crazy things that he does. In 1944, barely a year after the opening of JPL, Jack Parsons was expelled and said to get the fuck out. We want nothing to do with you. We cannot have you or your name associated with what's going on here because of the things that you do in your private life. His security clearance was stripped along with the other members of his little rocket group, his close Mm -hmm. people. Well, and this is where Jack Parsons' life starts that downward spiral, I think. So that same next year, he ended up getting a divorce from his first wife, Helen, after having an affair with her sister Mm -hmm. because Helen was not about crazy sex party orgies and she would sit in her room and complain and get pissed off at him (laughs) while her sister Sarah was like, tits out, heels to the air, let's see what weird sex magic we can do. 
So he ended up being involved with Sarah because she was okay with all the weird, creepy shit that was going on. What a weird lesson for all of us ladies to learn. Gets, if you're not down, you're out. Well, it gets, it gets weirder <laughs> because do you want to know who Sarah ended up leaving Jack Parsons for? L. Ron Hubbard. L. fucking Ron Hubbard. Wait, did we just say L. Ron Hubbard? Same as Aleister Crowley. We're not going to get real into L. Ron Hubbard because he definitely deserves his own episode. I don't know whether or not Bree's ever going to let us do that, but like, I wish. L. Ron Hubbard was a part of all of these sex crazy party orgies. He wasn't really known at the time. He was just a very small town kind of like sci-fi writer. Some people knew about him. If you weren't really into sci-fi, you didn't know who he was. But Jack, being somebody who is a diehard sci-fi fan since he was little, I only imagine how he ended up becoming friends with L. Ron Hubbard, you know? Yeah, he said he was the most Thelmic person he's ever known. Ever known. And definitely the Thelma religion, cult, whatever it is you want to call it. The OTO. The OTO, exactly, is really the beginning and the founding of Scientology. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard mixed in all of these things from the OTO and all of his science fiction novels, and that's what Scientology is today. Now, you could also hear this side that, which I believe Mike Barra mentioned, which I do hear a lot about this, was that he was working for the Naval Intelligence and the CIA, and so he was there to infiltrate on Jack Parsons and blow the whole thing up. But that's not really what happened, because at the end of the day, what happened is Sarah went off with L. Ron Hubbard. They told Jack that they were going to go down to Florida and open up a yacht business. And Sarah said, hey, I'll go down there first. You give me and L. Ron here about, you know, maybe $250. We'll set it up. And then we'll send for you when everything's ready and we can come down and we'll continue our crazy sex party magic on a boat. But that's not what happened. Sarah took the money, took off with L. Ron Hubbard, and they went down to Florida and they bought a yacht, but they never, ever came back for Jack Parsons. Well, you get what you get. So that's where them two split off. And that's where L. Ron Hubbard starts the Sea Org and the beginnings of Scientology. And Jack Parsons is kind of stuck back at home. With his little experiments. With his experiments. Did you know he actually went back to court and sued L. Ron Hubbard and got his $250,000 back in the long run? Nice. Yeah. Could you imagine if he sued now? I mean, obviously he's dead, but what Scientology is worth today Damn. Damn. It was probably initially founded and funded off of Jack Parsons' money. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's what bought that first yacht. Yeah. <laughs> that first Scientology yacht. So can we, can me and you say between each other here and, you know, our listeners that Jack Parsons technically is the godfather of Scientology then? Oh my God. He was the producer. Do we want to go that far? Jack I want to Par- die tomorrow. Jack Parsons, producer, Scientology. Somebody put that on his IMDb, please. (laughs) (laughs) Producer of Scientology. So after he took off, he was a little bit strapped for cash, obviously, and he didn't have a job. He was this really brilliant person, and he didn't really have much to go off of. So he ended up kind of, sort of, secretly, not secretly working for the Israel rocket program. And when the U.S. kind of got a whiff that this was going on, let's just say they weren't very pleased to know that that was happening. And in 1952, Parsons allegedly, allegedly, I'm going to use that word very heavily here, allegedly died in his home laboratory in an explosion because they say that he accidentally mixed some chemicals together and blew himself up. After, what, 30 years fucking around with rockets and different chemicals? You know, and you know what? They never actually identified a body. No, they there did not. There was never any work of at all, nothing of the sort of that done. Nothing was done like that. And that's kind of where the conspiracy theories start to pile up. You have A, was he murdered by the government because he was going to be working with a different country? And at the time, America was like, absolutely not. You cannot. We are number one. Did he commit suicide because he was distraught that his life was in shambles and he couldn't do anything with himself? Or was it a genuine accident? I would say, especially from that time of year, I mean, 1952, this is like, this is when we have all kinds of shit happen. I mean, this is that huge flyover over Washington, the UFOs, which pretty much at this point, I think is almost agreed upon that it was the Nazi flyover. Mm -hmm. He was the whole start of our rocket program, Mm -hmm. if you will. Really, everyone wanted him. I feel like If this was the beginning of our secret space program, it could be done for him to have faked his death in order to be recruited into the secret space program. He could have gone off planet. Absolutely. 100%. 
there is the possibility that he was either recruited and went off or aliens came down and abducted him and blew up his laboratory to make it look like he was dead. I sort of feel like there's so much occultism wrapped up in this entire story Mm -hmm. on the German side on the American side with Jack Parsons. And since we're kind of migrating towards NASA, there's this whole occult background of NASA. I mean, even on their patches, which we can get into, you know, the, the time, the time, the date where things are taken off, everything has this occult meaning. So who better to have kind of started that, be the mastermind behind that, than the occultist Jack Parsons? You know, we're getting into to NASA here. So if Maybe some of you guys don't know, but the JPL is referred to today as NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They call it JPL for short, but it's NASA's is the moniker in front of it. But a lot of people say it's the Jack Parsons Laboratory. Yeah, that's what I feel like because it's JPL, Jack Mm -hmm. Parsons Laboratory. Yeah. Obviously, I think that if we go back through time, we know that our government and government agencies are always slightly rooted in some sort of occultism. Oh, yeah. This whole story, everything is. When you start to dig into NASA and you look at something just as simple as their patches or their logos and things like that, it's so interesting how the thread continues on with this occultism. So you're right. It seems so interesting that all of this was was founded upon a cult and then secretly continued by the occult. And that his death was around the time that we switched with Operation Paperclip. It's all the same time frame. There's two different timelines. That's a center point where they meet. Now when you look back, there's so many links to each other. And I think that's the whole, the biggest problem with the secret space program is it's so hard to go in a linear timeline because every single person is on their own timeline, but they all intertwine with each other. There's a thread that's pulled through all of these. Like, you know, I, we couldn't start off with saying Jack Parsons. We had to start it off with Nazis. And although we're not done with Nazis, we had to stop and go back and show you the American side of what we were going on here while the Nazis were in space and having alien contact and they were down in Antarctica in their, you know, underground base down there in their Hawaiian t-shirts and their (laughs) frozen coconut drinks. Jack Parsons was here single-handedly by himself trying to get us to space. With magics. With sex magic. With sex magic. He He was trying Trying to get us to space through orgasm. But really, it worked. And that's the, so. that's the fucked up part about it all. So Jack Parsons is a known person. We all know about him. He's said to be an occultist, but a lot of normal people that you ask on the street don't necessarily know how deep into the occult he was. Not at all. But it's a, hit. It was sweeped under the rug. Exactly. But a lot of people who do know about it really do accredit the reason we're in space today is because of him. And there's that possibility of it maybe could have only happened because of the occult. I know, isn't that kind of crazy? And we On both sides. On both sides. And we'll never know that answer personally. I don't think so. I think that there's people there out there who know that answer, for sure. But I don't think that it's something that me or you are privy to that kind of information at all. But no. But I would I, love to know. There's enough questions. And for me, I feel like there's enough evidence to lean me towards that way. Absolutely. Too and, many things line up, dude. Way too many things line up. And I will say, you know, Jack Parsons isn't necessarily recognized as much as he should be. Not at all. But one thing that... NASA did do is they named a crater after him. On the moon, there is a Jack Parsons crater. But get this shit. This is where it gets weird. It's on the dark side of the moon. And I think that there's several different possible reasons of why it's on the dark side of the moon. A, did they put him on the dark side of the moon because they're trying to forget him? They were like, well, we want him to be known, but let's put him over there on the other side where like no one will ever look at his crater or say his name. (laughs) Or B, Did they put him there because that's maybe part of a ritual? Maybe they're, you know, we have bases on the dark side of the moon and they put that over there in remembrance to him as like a peace offering. Or that's his new mansion is on the dark side of the moon. He switched from his mansion in Pasadena to a mansion on the dark side of the moon and really they just called it a tribute. Exactly. So, you know, who knows why they threw him on the dark side of the moon, but I do find it interesting of all the places the dark side of the moon is where they put him. You know, I mean, not saying like he probably has a grave somewhere, but like in my mind, that's his grave is that crater on the dark side of the moon. Like when I think of him, I think of NASA's crater that they named after him. So it's interesting that I have to think to the dark side of the moon in order to remember him. And that's just the beginning of NASA, man. That's just the beginning mention. Our next episode is going to get filthy. Yeah, it's going to get a little aggressive. Um, Should we apologize to Mountain View now? I mean, there's no point because every episode (laughs) you end it the same way. So you can't say sorry if you don't mean it. 
Baby, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Yeah, exactly. So make sure you guys tune into our next episode, Secret Space Program Part 4, where we're going to be dipping our toes into NASA. Let's do our favorite part of the episode. Shout outs. Shout outs. Shout outs. <laughs> Shit outs. Shit outs. Shit out of here. Shit out of here. All right, we have our first level, which is our skeptics, and we have Jan from The Good, The Bad, and The Just Plain Standard podcast. Then we have our truth seekers, Jamie Shana's mom. Jamie Shana's mom. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I need to think about what you said because I was like, wait, that's not right. <gasps> Shana, Jamie's mom. Hey, Mama. We have Destiny at Destiny from Space. Shout out to Destiny because I know that she loves Jack Parsons, so she's going to love this episode. And just know that we love you. We're going to go to our made-up category, our first one, which is the Skeptical Truth Seeker. And we have Adam from Not For Everyone podcast. Then we have our middle bitches, Raya, the one and the only. Raya, love you. We also have Scotty at Scotty Doodle. And we also have Bobby from Not For Everyone podcast. And you can find him at Pinball Bobby and at Not For Everyone podcast on Instagram. We're going to go into our second made-up category, which is the skeptical middle bitch ap at weather traditions who we will again you guys we're going to be doing an interview with her soon so wait for that tune in listen to it it's going to be good and we have our last category our favorite our world anything is possible matt thank you matt i just want to let you know that when we were recording um last week you'll hear us at the end of the episode say where have you been i haven't heard from you and then immediately the next day (laughs) Yeah. We heard from you. So it was funny that we put that out there and then it, it happened. It really was. I don't even think we had released that episode and then he had got back to you. Before. I know. He actually gave us some really good ideas for some episode topics. So me and you will be going over those later. Nice. Right before the new year. Exactly. So we just want to thank all of you guys. We love all of our patrons. And if you guys want to support us, you can check us out at patreon.com backslash that one time I was abducted. Get some cool swag. Maybe listen to some of our pre-pod, which, you know, a lot of our listeners don't know about because they're not patrons. But there is a second podcast that we have that really doesn't have anything to do with aliens or anything in general. Sometimes, but it's pretty cool. It's just some random things. If you just want to listen to us bullshit and be funny and silly, and the, the topics vary so much, I can't even pinpoint anything that it could be down to. But I agree. If you want to listen to it for a dollar a month, you can get some more of us. Make sure you guys check us out on Instagram at that one time I was abducted. Shoot us an email at that one time I was abducted at gmail.com and all the other social media shits that are out there. Thank you guys so much for listening. We love you love all. Love you so much. Have a great night. Fuck you, Mountain View, California. Happy holidays. We love you all. Hey guys, this is Georgia with Ancient Aliens, and you're listening to That One Time I Was Abducted by Aliens with Jamie and Bree. You're listening to That One Time I Was Abducted by Aliens. I'm Jamie. I'm Bree, and we're two sides of the coin. Happy holiday season, truth seekers.